We had a fellow who lived with us in Hanoi. When he was a child, his parents used to insist, they insisted that every year he had to memorize a poem which he would then recite at the annual family Thanksgiving dinner. He hated it, of course. But now, years later, we're sitting around in jail, Norm's re able to recall great quantities of poetry. We get a message come tap through the wall, say, Norman is working on the highwayman. He's stuck on the line that comes after, plating a dark red love knot into her long black hair. Who can help? We love to get those messages. We could argue for days, whether, we could discuss for days, whether anybody had ever heard of the highwaymen, read the highwaymen, knew anything about the highwaymen, then we just make up lines and send them back to Norm. <laughs> He's working hard over there, and we wanted to help. Eventually, through the wall, a line at a time would come the highwaymen, and we'd memorize it as it came. We had huge quantities of material memorized. Some of the things we memorized, we memorized just for the beauty of the words. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there's been some mistake. The only other sound's the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep. But I have promises to keep. Miles to go before I sleep. Miles to go before I sleep. Some of the things we memorized, we memorized for the sound of the words. Uh, you may talk of gin and beer when you're caught and safe out here, when sent to penny fight or altar shot it. But when it's time for slaughter, you'll do your work on water and lick the blooming boots of him what's got it. Now an inch of sunny climb where I used to spend my time in the service of Her Majesty the Queen. Of all our black-faced crew, the finest man I knew was the regimental beastie, Gunga Dean. Some of the things we memorized had great significance for us personally. Um, maybe the way things go some days, they would have significance for you personally. Uh, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve their term long after they are gone, so go on when there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, hang on. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not whined or cried aloud. Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. My head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Forever. I suppose it was natural since we were so enamored with those kinds of things that I would, we would try to write some poetry ourselves. I wrote a poem in French. <laughs> Do any of you speak French? <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> First verse, je me demande comment dit-on tu es le monde à moi, par je veux dire ces choses chéries à toi, autant de moi. It was perfect. <laughs> I knew you wondered about it. I have a good friend, I remember when he wrote his first poem, it was after the first meal of the day. Jerry took a bite out of a hunk of bread, he looked down, he started his first poem, went like this. Little weevil in my bread, I think I just bit off your head. <laughs> it kind of went downhill from there, but. We got him started. How do we do it? See, we laughed a lot. Laughter was one of our biggest coping mechanisms. It was kind of the way we tried to keep things in perspective, to cope with the pressure in our lives, to do it. So I wonder how you do that. I wonder how you cope with the pressure in your life. I wonder how you keep things in some sort of perspective. I wonder how you, see, I'll, here's another thing I learned in prison. I know clearly, unequivocally, beyond a shadow of any doubt, who's responsible for the coping and balance in your life? 
you are. And if you don't take care of it, it's not going to get done. It is so easy to mess up our lives. It'd be easy. How easy is it supposed to be? Worry yourself into some sort of an ulcer. Pretty easy, I think. How easy is it supposed to be? How easy is it for us to ruin relationships that are important to us? Pretty easy, I think. How easy is it supposed to be? Drink yourself into a bottle. It's so easy to mess up our lives. And somehow we've got to keep this in perspective. I'll tell you something else I learned in prison. I know I'll never understand this. As long as I live, I'll never understand this. But I learned that the Lord God, creator of the universe, cares about my life. And he cares about your life. See, we don't have to do this by ourselves. But somehow we got to keep this under, in, in balance. we got to cope. One of our coping mechanisms was laughter. We had a fellow went to interrogation. The interrogator wanted to know, in your country, where does your family live? He told him, Kansas. He said, what do your family do? He said, they're farmers. He said, what do your family grow? Did they grow up, Doc? Later on, the interrogator took him to his cell, and he comes over to our cell, and the little spider opens up, bang! And there stands the elf. We have names for these people. And the elf wants to know, what's up, Doc? What's up, Doc? He keeps saying, what's up, Doc? And we are thinking to ourselves, the elf has blown a fuse here. It doesn't make a lick of sense. He wants to know what's up, Doc. And then he starts to get excited. And the next thing you know, he's got his head jammed in that little hole. His veins are spitting all over him. See, probably now you could identify a lot more closely with interrogators, spouses, bosses. It's not good for these people to get excited. He demands to know what's up, Doc. We're saying, oh, give us a hint, give us a hint. Finally says, up, Doc, you don't go to the farm in Kansas. We say, oh, up, Doc, about this high. We taught him everything there is to know about up, Doc. We give him, we give him the recipe for up, Doc bread. Whatever he wanted to learn, we were teaching. We laughed a lot. We had a fellow who had a cockroach, and he had built a chariot for his cockroach. He was concerned that someday we would announce that we wanted to have cockroach chariot races. So every day he would get his cockroach out, put the chariot on it, and run it around in a loop in the center of his cell. He was training his entry. If we're going to have races, you want to be ready to go. One day during a training session, the inevitable happened. Cockroach got out of the loop, under the door, and was gone. Now, you picture yourself on the other side of the wall. The message that comes tapping through says, have you seen a cockroach pulling a chariot? <laughs> How do we do it? We did what we had to do. We did our best. We chose to grow through that experience. We kept our sense of humor, and we kept the faith. Faith in ourselves, our ability to endure. Gut it out. Tomorrow's coming. I'm going to be there. Faith in ourselves no matter what happens. Faith in ourselves to be able to make this. See, I see that as directly translatable into your life. Faith in ourselves to be able to do the things we have to do. Faith in ourselves to be able to make the decisions we have to make. Faith in ourselves to be able to stand on our feet and say, this is right and this is wrong and this is where I stand. Faith in ourselves no matter what. Faith in ourselves. You know, in Philippians, Paul wrote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You notice he didn't write, I can do some of the things, or I can do the easy things, or I can do the... He said, I can do all things. Faith in ourselves. We did it through faith in each other. I've lived with men who, if they didn't hold my life in their hands, they held the next best thing to it, and I knew they'd do the best that they could do. And when the situation was reversed, they granted that to me, that I would do the best that I could do. And it's that kind of faith and confidence in each other that allows us to live together, work together, be together effectively, successfully. It's all built on a foundation of trust and confidence. We did it through faith in this country. We live in the greatest nation that has ever existed on the face of the earth. This is a land of freedom. This is a land of achievement. This is a land of opportunity. This is the land they're kicking the doors down trying to get in. This is the land. See, the problem is you and I are buried in what's wrong with this country. We are inundated with what's wrong with this country. And it's all out of whack and it's all out of proportion. Hey, if you turn on the, you might not do it tonight. When the next time you turn on the evening news, how much are you going to see about what's wrong with this country and how much will you see about what's right with this country? And that is so grossly out of proportion, out of whack. 
How do we do it? I did it through faith in God. I was never alone over there. I've lived with men who profess to be some sort of atheist or agnostic. I believe it was more difficult for them. I don't think that was any accident. I think when the scripture tells us that God is faithful, I'm here to tell you that God is faithful. God is faithful. Now, I've had a lot of things happen to me in my life. And, and, and I want you to know tonight that the single greatest influence in my life has been being in Bible study since 1985. I mean, that no matter what happens in our lives, we've been given the ability to make all those choices. How do you choose? And I want you to know this evening that the single greatest choice you will ever have to make in your life is what you're going to do about Jesus Christ. Now, here's the way it works. God is perfect, and I am not. I'm not sure about you, but I'm not. Okay, so how am I, with all my failings, going to ever reconcile myself with a perfect God? I'm, there's no way for me to do that. I can't do that. I know I can't do that. I know myself too well. So, God fixed it. And he bridged the gap between my imperfection, the Bible calls that sin, and his perfection through the God-man, Jesus Christ. And the single greatest choice you'll ever have to make in your life is what you're going to do about that. Because it's just a matter of choice. It's a matter of choice. And the only way to be reconciled with a perfect God is through Jesus Christ. The only way for us to be reconciled. Why? Because we've heard the story. You've heard the news. Okay? Don't worry about those people in Africa who've never heard anything. God will take care of that. The problem is our problem, because we've heard. How do we do it? We did what we had to do. We did our best. We chose to go through that experience. We kept our sense of humor. We kept the faith. All of that's a matter of choice. Things are going to happen in your life that are totally out of control. But you've been given the ability to choose. Now, I'm out of airspeed, altitude, and ideas all about the same time. If anybody has any questions or wants to make any comments, I'd be happy to try to field them. It works pretty well. You make up questions. I make up answers. <laughs> <clears throat> anybody have anything? Any, any questions? Any comments? Answer that exactly. She asked me, did the other P, all these other guys come to the Lord? I don't know. But it, it, sometimes I get asked this question. Are there, you know the little saying, there are no atheists in foxholes. Is that true? What do you think of that? And here's what I think of that. If there are atheists in foxholes, the only reason is because it is not deep enough and dirty enough yet. There are no atheists. Hey, when you watch the towers coming down on 9-11 and all those people running through the streets of New York, what were they saying? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. God help us. Oh, my God. Why? Because it's a, that vacuum is built in us by the God that created us. So, I don't know. Any other comments or questions? How easy was it to... Like that. It was, hey, it was kind of hard going that way, but it was easy coming this way. <laughs> and you know, and it, truthfully... Um, See, I'm trying to describe five and a half years of my life, and there were changes in this time frame. Uh, and what I would tell you, this, these words would never have occurred to us at the time, but now I would tell you that what I think we were doing in those cells the last couple of years was group therapy. See, we're locked up forever, 24-7. We could pick any subject, talk about it as much as we wanted, talk about it again, do it again. And, and we were literally, I believe, doing group therapy. So when we came home, there was no adjustment, really, that I can remember. 
I mean, you know, the food gave me problems for a little while, but it didn't slow me down. Um, and, and so there wasn't much transit. Now, you know, we have had a few people with problems, uh, and we've had a couple of suicides, but you know, there were 600 of us all together, and you might have those problems in any group of 600, probably, I don't know. Yeah. Yes. What led to our release? When uh, President Nixon sent Henry Kissinger to negotiate the end of our involvement in Southeast Asia and the withdrawal, we were part of that deal. A prisoner exchange was part of that deal. And so in the spring of 1973, we were released in four large groups. I have not been back to Vietnam. Um, would I go back to Vietnam? If it were billable. <laughs> you understand billable? If it were billable, I'd probably go back. But I don't think I'll go back on my own or with my own money. I mean, I've already been there, for starters. Uh, and uh, um, I know guys that have gone back. It doesn't seem to be any big shakes to me. I'm not really, I'd rather spend my money to go to other places, so, yeah. Uh, well, the technology now to avoid the missile coming in is um, much better than it was then. Uh, but if that missile gets too close, <laughs> it, all the technology in the world doesn't help, you know. So, yeah, they have better stuff now, and they, they're more successful now. Um, but quite frankly, if I hadn't had the bright idea to go this way and had just gone this way, that would have been successful too. We do have an opportunity to get together. We have a loose-knit association. Its only function in the world is to plan reunions. They're on the weirdest reunion schedule you've ever heard of. And uh, I get to about half. They have too many reunions. I mean, these guys like to get together and talk about the good old days. <laughs> and and um, uh, they have, hey, I, I have a friend, I heard him one day, he said, hey, tell me what was wrong with that experience. I didn't have any money problems, wife problems, kid problems. <laughs> I said, now what was, and I said, you're a sick man, Bill. Uh, uh, so we, we do get together. In, uh, in May, we had our 40th reunion uh, from when we were released up in Newport Beach, and uh, here's what it's like when we get together. We do not talk about the Chargers, the Dallas Cowboys, um, the current administration, the, these guys, you know, the ones that I've lived with, for, and we're close, we're so close. And my first roommate came up to me in Newport Beach and grabbed me and said, hey, I'll buy you a drink. I said, good idea. I think you owe me one anyway. And so he bought me a drink. He said, we need to talk. I said, yeah, sure, what do you want to talk about? So we go over and we sit down at a little table and he says, I'm trying to decide what to do with the rest of my life. And that was the beginning of the conversation. So it, it's, um, it gets to the heart of the matter pretty quickly. Yeah. Our captors were, <clears throat> um, it, it, Vietnam, my time in Hanoi is my only experience with a totalitarian society, okay? Those people, they were, first of all, they were poorly educated. They were agrarian for the most part. And the, the guards who watched us were mm, uh, probably what we would call militia or, I don't know, home guard or something like that. They weren't uh, frontline forces. Um, but it was like they turned them on and off with a little switch. When it get real quiet at night, over the walls of the prison, in the little villages, you could hear the, the, the radio speaker. And that's the way it was over there. The radio speakers were all wired up to some place, and the only thing they got was Hanoi. And so one night, they'd play this little music over the, la, 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 la. you know, next morning, the turnkey'd come, he'd open the door, and go dump the buckets, you know, no big deal. That night, they'd play the war on those speakers. <laughs> next morning, that turnkey would open that door, and he'd come in there like the wrath of God. He was, it was, and then the next night, they'd play the music, and he'd be back. And, you know, I've never seen anything like that. Um, we were not allowed to learn Vietnamese. It would have been the perfect place to learn Vietnamese. <laughs> but they, did, they wanted that to be the working language between their officers and their guards. And so they didn't allow the guards to learn English, and they didn't allow us to learn Vietnamese. Um, and and uh, uh, so they, they just had, like, total control. There was, there was nobody 
and had stepped out of line. Uh, there, they didn't, there were a few of them. They didn't step very far out of line. They were. So I, I don't know. I've never had an experience like that. I've never been around just so much control, or it seemed like control to us at any rate. Um, some of them were kind of sadistic, took great pleasure in beating on us, and the others, you know, they did what they were told to do. They were told to beat us, they beat us. If they were told to leave us alone, they left us alone. They were just, they were just people. They were just people. Um, and I've, by the way, just forgiven all that. I've let all that go. See, I'm not going to wrap my life around, in a negative way, around something that happened like that in my past. Uh, so, it's okay with me. I've forgiven Jane Fonda. <laughs> no, I've just forgiven them all. I got no, I'm not going to get all worked up about that stuff. I did think it was kind of cool when they had her picture in the urinals at March Air Force Base, but, <laughs> but I've forgiven. Um, the PTSD problem and the Vietnam veteran problem and the current veteran problems and the, um, according to me, are all blown out of proportion. Um, uh, in in uh, Vietnam, you know, in Vietnam we had somewhere near nine and a half million Americans involved in the service. And yes, we do have a slightly higher than normal percentage of problems in the Vietnam veterans group, but nothing like. I don't believe it's anything like you probably think it is, where there's all these homeless veterans and all this problem with them. There are lots of them. I, I don't deny that, but it's not, it's not anything like um, the press would lead you to believe. It, the, the, the numbers, just the real statistics just aren't there. So that's sort of one answer. Another answer is I think we've made a mistake labeling it. When the troops came home from World War II, we had a lot of problems. But basically, they had to hook themselves up by their bootstraps and get going. And most of them did. Now, there were still problems, but most of them did. Now, we kind of, we send them off with the expectation you're going to come back with PTSD. And so, they come back. And, you know, so I'm, there's a lot of complicated answers there. Um, the whole subject of resiliency is another category of answers. Uh, I, ju I just, uh, I, th I think we've done a disservice. In the Vietnam Veterans Group, we did a disservice because it's the only time in our nation's history when we have sent people to war and when they came back, we spit on them. We didn't take them into our arms as a society. And I think that accounts for why there's a higher than normal percentage of problems in that group. Um, uh, and, and now we send them off with a, some sort of expectation that you're going to get, you're going to get come back screwed up. Uh, you know, I, we don't do a good job, I don't think. Hmm. Well, I don't know. <laughs> That's, um, well, here's here's what he, I'll tell you. Uh, this may be the answer to your question. I, at my level of maturity. We don't use the O word. At my level of maturity, when I look back on my life, God's hand is so clear in that that it scares me. It scares me. See, there's, there's zero doubt. In, I, I know exactly why I was shot down. I know exactly why I went through that experience. I know exactly why Karen was diagnosed with breast cancer. I know exactly why Karen died from breast cancer. I, under, I know. And part of the reason is so that I would be standing right here at this point in time talking to you, witnessing from my faith. It's very clear to me. It's, it just happens over and over and over again. You know, I, I mean, I, I speak at corporate meetings, sales meetings, you, get, you name it, I've been there, and uh, somebody always asks me some question that opens the door, and I witness from my faith. It's very clear to me. There's no doubt. It doesn't matter, by the way, that I didn't like that. You know that I was very upset with all. It doesn't matter. That's not. It's not me. I'm a little. I'm a little pawn in this whole God's plan, and I'm just trying to respond to the opportunities that are given to me. 
So I would say that that, that understanding is probably what accounts for your misguided interpretation. <laughs> of, <laughs> for such a time as this, that's right. What, is, what was Esther told by Mordecai? You've been prepared for such a time as this. Fortunately, they gave me a roommate after about a month and a half. So they bring this guy in, and they big lecture. They give me, they throw this guy in my cell. And we fall into each other's arms, and we're crying and hugging. And finally, we sit down and we start telling each other our stories, and they're the same, which was a huge comfort to me, because I figured I was going to be a man without a country. I mean, how could I come home and face people? I hadn't done what I was supposed to do. And then here was Tom, and he's got the same story. I said, Tom, you and I, we'll be buddies. <laughs> we, if we ever get out of here, we'll just bum around the world together. Cause we, and then, you know, then we go through more roommates and more cellmates, and we find out the same, it's the same story everywhere. Um, but that initial sh sh shock was just crushing. It was crushing. I think we're out of time. Ken has a schedule, and uh, he's been trying to run his schedule, and I want him to be successful in running his schedule.